Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Midweek Matter Moment here at in San Antonio, Texas at the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, where our pastor is Dr. Kenneth R. Kemp, and our first lady is Lady Velma Kemp. We are delighted to have you with us today, and it is our prayer that through the move of the Holy Spirit, that something will be said that uh, transforms your life, that encourages you in a way, and if you are not saved, that will make you ask, what must I do to be saved? Let us pause for a word of prayer. Eternal and all wise God, how we thank you for being God. Because you are God, we are to cast our cares upon you for you care for us. Because you are God, we know that you can, we can trust you, that you will not change, that you will not lie, and that you will always be victorious. Because you are God, we have full assurance that you have all power in your hand and you are in control of every situation, oh God. Lord, we love you, we love you, and we know that you love us. Now, God, we pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, would be acceptable in your sight. Lord God, you are my strength and my redeemer. And all God's children said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. This morning, if you have your Bible, I ask that you would turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. We will be reading from the third chapter, verse 1 and verse 4. The text reads, To everything there is a season a time to every purpose under the sun, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Amen. May the word of God bless you and keep you. As I was preparing for uh, this sermon today, I was um, reminded of the fact that as a nation, we are fast approaching an unfathomable reality. The fact is that Almost 100,000 people have died because of COVID-19. The loss of life during this pandemic is staggering. It is unbelievable that we would even be at this point. And um, I don't think we expected to be here. I know there was talk about us being here. I know none of us wanted to get to this number. This is not something we should be proud of as a country. And I know that um, we've not necessarily stopped to think about what that means. What does it mean to lose 100,000 people? The editors of the New York Times were thinking about that. Um, how were they gonna mark if we got to that 100,000 death toll? How would they um, honor those who had died and what they decided was, and maybe some of you all saw it on this past Sunday, the front page of the New York Times listed 1,000 names. Not pictures, just names, ages, and a brief detail. And those 1,000 persons represented 1,000 people who had died of COVID. The paper was, when you looked at it, it was overwhelming because you just saw rows and rows, and then there were bolded spaces and every bolded space represented someone's name. Every bolded space represented a mother, a father, a cousin, an auntie, an uncle, a godmother, a best friend. It represented someone special in someone else's life. And as I was looking at the front page of the paper, I got this overwhelming feeling. I just felt this deep need to weep, this deep need to mourn. And the more I thought about it, I realized that I was a little frustrated because as a nation, I hadn't felt like we had stopped to pay homage to all of those who had lost their lives. I didn't feel like we had collectively began to lament and to mourn our loss. I know we are people who like feel good stories. We like to focus on the triumphs. We don't like focusing on the loss. We like focusing on the fact that people are recovering. And hear me when I say that is, um, it, should be, it should be celebrated that in the world, 2.3 million people have recovered. Here in the United States, over 350,000 people have recovered from COVID-19. And here in San Antonio, the seventh largest city in the nation, we've had relatively low deaths of only 69 people. But even saying only doesn't take into consideration that 69 was somebody's mother, somebody's father, and even people who were dear to us at our church. I'm not saying we don't celebrate that, but I have not seen um, 
a plan for us to pause and calculate the human loss and what it means. There's been lots of discussion about the economic loss that COVID has caused us and uh, ca caused the global world. And hear me when I say, I recognize that COVID has had a devastating impact on us economically. But I think it's safe to say, we are a resilient, resourceful nation. We can resurrect an economy, but we cannot resurrect the dead, nor should we not mourn the dead and weep over those that we have lost. So as we are moving through this season, I felt the Holy Spirit wanting me to remind us that there will come a time in all of our lives where we will need to weep and mourn. And it is our, my prayer that we don't let that pass us by, that we don't try to explain it away, that we don't try to ignore it, that we don't try to deny it, but in fact that we actually embrace it and be willing to do the weeping and the mourning that is necessary. So for the time that is before me, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, I want to preach from the theme, it's okay to weep and to mourn. It is okay to weep and to mourn. In this third chapter of Ecclesiastes, the author Kohelet reminds us that there's a time for everything. There's a season for everything. There's a time to be born and there's going to be a time to die. There's going to be a time to plant and a time to pluck up. There's even a time for weeping and for mourning. And there's even a time for laughing and for dancing. I wonder what it is about us that we shy away from the weeping. I don't know if it's because we've been taught that weeping is a sign of weakness. I don't know if we've been taught that um, you keep it all in. You don't let it out. It's too messy. People don't want to deal with our weeping and our mourning. I don't know if we've been trained to suppress our feelings. I'm not sure what it is, um, but some of us have an easier time at weeping. I do. Others have a harder time at it. But weeping and mourning is as natural as breathing in and out. The Bible has a long biblical history of mourning. Uh, Jacob mourned the loss of Joseph when he thought that he was dead and had been torn apart by wild animals. Uh, the children of Israel mourned and wept over Moses when he died. They wept and mourned for some 30 days. We know in the Old Testament, the story of Hannah. Hannah wept every year when she went to the temple. Every year that she went to church, she wept and mourned over her uh, barrenness and the fact that Paniah, her husband's other wife, could have babies and she could not. And Paniah was the bane of her existence and made her life horrible. And every year, Hannah would weep and mourn and take her uh, weeping and mourning to the church house, to the temple. We have a long history of the Bible gives us a long history of weeping and mourning. David wept and mourned when his mentor Saul died. David wept and mourned when his best friend Jonathan died. David wept and mourned when his son Absalom, who tried to kill him, ends up dying. And we know even Jesus wept and mourned. When Jesus' friend Lazarus died in the 11th chapter of the book of John, we see what is said, the shortest verses in the Bible. It says, Jesus wept. Jesus stood outside of the tomb of Lazarus, his friend who had been dead for four days, and he wept. So my brothers and sisters, it's okay to weep and to mourn. And we know it's okay. One of the reasons we know it's okay to weep and to mourn is that when we weep and mourn, we acknowledge our suffering, the reality of our suffering. The text says there will be a time, a time to weep doesn't say there might be a time, there may be a time, it says a time to weep, which means there's a reality that you will weep and mourn at some point in your life, that something will happen that will cause you not just to cry, but to weep. See, weeping is more guttural. Weeping comes from down on the inside. I can stump my toe and cry, but weeping is the thing that can cause um, me to open up my mouth but no sound comes out that it is from an uh, empathetic place 
that I am mourning the loss of something, that I am wailing, that I am in anguish. That is what weeping is. And when we weep, we acknowledge that we are suffering. And it is okay to admit that everything's not all right. It's okay to admit that you have been sad. It's okay to admit that things are not working out the way we thought they were going to work out. It is okay to weep and to mourn. When we weep and we mourn, we acknowledge the suffering of our, rea the reality of our suffering. We also give our permission to release our pain. Weeping is a way of releasing. It's a way of just getting it out. Too often we want to hold it in. I'm not sure if we're afraid people can't handle the weeping. I'm not sure if we're afraid we can't handle it. But I can tell you for one thing, God can handle it. God can handle our weeping. God can handle our mourning. And when we cry out to God, we give ourselves permission to get the weight up off of us and to give it to God. To release ourselves from the pain of whatever it is in our lives. We must take the time. We must make the time to weep and to mourn. And not just weep and mourn over COVID. COVID is has had a devastating effect on our lives. But y'all, some of us were suffering, as I've said before, before COVID arrived. As a people, as African Americans, we know something about weeping and mourning. We know something about releasing the pain. We've been weeping and mourning since we were brought to this country in chains. We've been weeping and mourning over the way we've been treated since we've gotten here, the way we've been ignored since we were brought here, the way we've been um, the way we've been trying to be erased out of the history with our contributions. But we can't just hold on to that. We got to get it out. We have to release it because if it stays down on the inside, it will turn on us. Weeping and mourning helps us to acknowledge our suffering, but it also helps us to release that pain, to get it out and to give it to someone, to give it to God who has the power to deal with it. The, the writer says at a, there will be a time for weeping. There will be a time for mourning. So if we do the weeping and we do the mourning, then we can be on our way to healing. See, it's okay to weep and to mourn because when we do that, we begin our journey to healing. You notice in this chapter, there's a negative and then there's a positive. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. We can't do the laughing and we can't do the dancing until we do the weeping and the mourning. The problem is we want to skip over the mourning and get straight to the celebration. But for the real healing to happen, you have to do the work in the morning. You have to do the work in the tears. You have to do the work in the weeping. You have to let the weeping do the work in you and I. And it is my fear that as a nation, we've not done the work. We've not done the work with the weeping and the mourning. We've not even acknowledged some of the pain that we in this nation are going through, not just with COVID, but we won't even acknowledge the pain of racism. We won't even acknowledge that we need to mourn uh, the way African Americans and Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans have been treated in this country. We need to weep over the fact that there are populations who don't have uh, good housing and have substandard schools. We need to weep and mourn over the fact that black men are still being incarcerated at rates far beyond any other. We need to weep and mourn over the fact that our children are still coming out of school not quite able to read and be on the same level as their counterparts. We need to release the pain and weep and mourn over the fact that even during COVID, we have seen three deaths of unarmed African Americans. We need to weep and mourn over Ahmaud Arbery. We need to weep and mourn over Breonna Taylor. We need to weep and mourn over Mr. George Floyd, who died in police custody with an officer's knee upon his neck because he could not breathe. We need to release that. We can't get to the celebrating until we acknowledge the reality of our suffering. Yeah, there will be dancing. There will be laughing. That's the good news. But you got to do the work before the healing can start. Weeping and mourning. We don't like it, but it's a part of our reality. So, Reverend, where's the good news? 
You can't just leave me in the weeping in the morning. And I know we don't like to be left there. As I was thinking about uh, this sermon, I'm reminded of how many Good Friday services we've sat in. And the preacher couldn't leave us in Friday. Couldn't leave us just with Jesus dying and dead on a cross. Couldn't leave us in the pain. Couldn't leave us in the humiliation. Couldn't leave us with a dead Jesus in the tomb. And they rushed us past Friday or rushed us past Saturday to get us to Sunday morning where Jesus gets up with all power in his hand and, and everything is good. Sometimes we got to sit in the weeping in the morning for a little while before we can get to the laughing and the dancing. So where is the good news, Pastor? Preacher, where is the good news? The good news is that weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Joy will come in the morning, but you and I don't get to decide when morning comes. And while we are waiting for morning, we need to do the work of acknowledging our suffering. We need to do the work of giving ourselves permission to release the pain. We need to do the work of moving from the weeping in the morning to the healing because God will allow morning to come, but he determines when morning comes. There's some of you all who are grieving and people are trying to push you past your grief. They're trying to tell you it's been long enough. You need to buck up. It's grandpa been gone. You need to move on. If you need to sit in that weeping and you need to sit in that mourning, it's okay. The word in the New Testament tells us that we're to rejoice with those who rejoice and we are to weep with those who weep. I told you Jesus wept. I think it was interesting. He made time for weeping. When he knew, in fact, in just a little while, Lazarus would, raise, would be raised from the dead. He knew that Lazarus would walk out of that tomb in his grave clothes and still in his right mind. But Jesus didn't even rush to the raising of Lazarus. He allowed uh, Mary and Martha to sit in their weeping and their mourning. Brothers and sisters, don't push past it. Don't waste this time. Take some time. Acknowledge your pain. Acknowledge your weeping and acknowledge your mourning. And God indeed will bring joy to you in the morning. Amen. It is my prayer that Something that was said during this sermon will prick your heart if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I ask that you simply invite him into your life because I promise you, you will have weeping and you will have mourning. But there's something about weeping and mourning, knowing that Jesus is on your side, knowing that he is walking with you, knowing that he died for your sins, knowing, you, knowing that he will never leave you nor forsake you. If you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you simply have to believe and confess. At the end of this um, sermon, there's going to be a placard that comes up that asks if you made the decision to make Christ your Lord and Savior, that you reach out to us here at the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. We would love to have you be a member of our virtual church, be a part of the Antioch Nation. We would love to help connect you to a church. But most of all, we would love to invite you into the family of Christ. Beloved, whatever you are going through, it is okay to weep and to mourn because joy will come in the morning. Amen.